All right. Well, good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. My name is Phil Barnes. I am the son of a Baptist minister. I've been in uh, ministry since 1998, which means for many of my spiritual fathers in this room, I remain very, very new to this work. And I am aware of that, um, that I'm speaking to, to men uh, that, and women that have been in this ministry for much longer than I have been. So um, before moving to Malawi, my family lived in West Africa, and I taught at the Ghana Baptist University College's School of Theology and Ministry. And you had to say all of that, the Ghana Baptist University College School of Theology and Ministry. But it functionally uh, is the, the Ghana Baptist Seminary. Uh, and I also taught at the Baptist uh, Theological Seminary in Kaduna, Nigeria. I've taught courses at these different institutions ranging from spiritual formation to Islam to missions to systematic theology to church history to New Testament to Old Testament and kind of whatever was needed from semester to semester, um, teaching at certificate and diploma levels. So um, uh, kind of a a wide range of things. Um, Before moving to Africa, however, you can see there, uh, we lived in uh, a Muslim area of Central Asia. And that's the image on the left, and the image on the right is when, of us in Nigeria and Kaduna. And both my MDiv and my PhD are from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, where my focus was missions and world religions. So one of the reasons that I mention all of my personal, uh, educational, and work experience is because there are men and women in this room that have been my supervisors in various aspects of my life, whether it's been work or school or whatever. So I'm looking and seeing Jeff and Barbara Singerman, who supervised us while we were in West Africa. And I see Zane Pratt, who was my regional leader when we were in Central Asia. Uh, Chuck Lawless was my dean at at, at Southern Seminary. Deanna Schatz was our mentor when we first arrived on the field in Nigeria. Dr. Chuga was my president in uh, Kaduna, and Reverend Adu is somewhere, or is Michael? Michael there was uh, the associate dean of the school when we were in Ghana, and if I've forgotten someone, I do apologize, and of course, Kevin continues to tell me what to do, so uh, thankful for all of these men and women and their investment in my life, and uh, so yeah, that maybe just gives you a little bit of, of background for us. Uh, here is a picture of uh, my family. My wife, Laura, is a pediatric clinician. In the States, we call it a nurse practitioner, but basically it means she kind of acts as a primary care provider, and she does that there in Malawi, uh, and uh, has an opportunity to use that actually to reach out to uh, an Asian, what we call Asian African population in Lilongwe, that as far as we can tell is not being engaged by any churches or any mission organizations, but these guys have been here two, three, four, five generations, and you, I'll meet some of these guys, and so uh, where are you from? And they say, I'm from Malawi, and my grandparents came, you know, came here in the 19th century. So, um, but as far as we can tell, this is a largely Muslim and Hindu population that nobody's reaching out to, and through her work at, at a local clinic, she's able to connect with some of those, uh, those families. And my son Daniel on the right, is actually a student here in Kenya at Rift Valley Academy. I was here uh, about a, a week ago visiting him and our other son, Jonathan, uh, there on the left, just finished grade six uh, and is still with us in Lee Longway. Um, only my students call me Dr. Barnes, and in sometimes, and maybe only the Americans will think this is funny, but sometimes they call me Dr. Phil. And uh, so, so, uh, but I hope that you'll just call me Phil. That's what my friends do. So, uh, again, that's probably more than you needed to know about me. Uh, so, more importantly, what is uh, AB 316? And contrary to Kevin's pronunciation, it is not AB 316. It is AB 316, Africa Baptist 316. And uh, we'll get you the, the background to the 316 in a, in a few minutes. Um, uh, but if you've heard of AB 316, it's probably because you're uh, one of the authors that one of that either me or one of my teammates has recruited to be a part uh, of a of a book project that we're working on. And if you've heard of AB 316, it's probably because you're one of those authors. And we're going to come back to that. And then if you haven't heard of this, 
then I, I, I want to give you a bit of a background to, to who we are and what we're doing. First, as you can see from our logo, and once again, Dr. Jimmy Bledsoe put together this logo for us, uh, very intentionally wanting to show that we are a part of AB10 and we are not a separate entity. Uh, and instead, we are a task force from within AB10 that has been given a specific role. So what is that role, you might be asking. So I'm glad you asked. And in order to answer that question, I want us to, to look at a uh, scripture here. A uh, very familiar passage, I'm sure, to many of us that are, are concerned with uh, the purity of Christ's bride and the health of the church. We know that these are words that Paul, uh, that Luke recorded as Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders, and they were true then and they are true today. Let me read them to us. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. These key verses, 29 and 30. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And then verse 30, men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years, I never stopped warning each one of you with tears. So these this warning was one that Paul gave 2,000 years ago, and they are seeing it played out then. And we know that from the history of the, Old, of the New Testament and the history of the early church, and it's continuing to play out across the world. And we're, we're concerned about how that's playing out here in Africa. Notice that Paul said that, he should, that we should be concerned about savage wolves that are coming in from the outside, but then also people from their own number who are going to rise up and distort the truth and lure disciples into following them. So we're seeing this reality uh, across Africa, not just across Africa. As Dr. Mburu uh, pointed out yesterday, the, the problems that are here in Africa are not uniquely African, but they are indeed African. And we're not the World Baptist Theological Education Network. We're the Africa Baptist Theological Education Network. So when we talk about concerns that we have for Africa, we're not trying to, to throw darts at African churches. We're not trying to throw darts at African brothers and sisters. We're, we're concerned about the health of the church, the purity of Christ's bride. And so that's why we're going to point out some things that are concerns, but it comes out of a concern that, that Paul left for us to be on the lookout for savage wolves that will seek to devour the flock of Christ. So earlier this week, our team met, and I'm going to introduce our team in a, in a few minutes, uh, but our team met and we talked about some of these realities. Uh, I'm going to mention a few of them, but uh, uh, this is not going to be an exhaustive kind of list. Um, and I also, I almost yesterday when, when Liz was talking, I thought, wow, this is great because it's just really preparing the way for us, and, and she really set us up to, for, for these realities, these different uh, distortions of the gospel, these dis distortions of the truth that are here. And, and she said one thing, she said, you know, she's perfectly convinced that Africa and the African church will be an influencer in the future that, that is to come. The question remains is what kind of influence that will be. And AB3, uh, AB316 exists to try to help us as African Baptists to ensure that that influence is going to be one that is gospel-centered, that is founded on the scriptures, and that promotes uh, the, the health of the church. So in that, with that in mind, let's look at a few of uh, what we're calling false theologies or aberrant theology that is uh, already here in Africa and that might be coming even uh, in Africa. First uh, one we have, classic liberalism. We know that classic liberalism has found its way into Africa. Sometimes this influence happens when our pastors and our pastoral students are sent off continent to study in liberal uh, institutions in North America and Europe, and they come back with false theologies that they've picked up in those places. 
Classic liberalism can also influence our schools through outside funding and training that comes in from off the continent. Uh, when when uh, we as IMB left theological institutions, there was a vacuum there, and oftentimes that vacuum was filled by those who would come in with funding and would teach false theology. My supervisor in my PhD program used to say, the one who pays the piper calls the tune. And so what we've seen is those that will come in from the outside willing to fund programs, willing to fund pastoral trainings, and they come in with false theology, and, that, and, and uh, oftentimes, tragically, uh, we've been led astray. Voss listed open theism. Open theism is a concept that may not be uh, openly, clearly taught under that guise, under that title, but we're seeing it creep into our churches when we fail to teach a robust biblical theolo theological idea of the Lord's sovereignty over all things. And then finally, uh, well, not finally, finally on this slide, uh, one another form of aberrant theology is the LGBTQ sympathies that are happening uh, around the world. And I talk to my students and they say, well, it's never going to come to Africa. Brothers and sisters, it will come. It's already here. And let me mention one thing here, and I, I hope you'll excuse me, and I don't, I don't want to step on any toes here, but one of the time, some of the times when I talk to my African brothers about these concerns, the response will be, no, here in our African culture, we'll never accept that kind of thing. And if that is our foundation, if our foundation and response to these realities is our culture, that's, that's not going to be an anchor that will keep us for long. If we say, no, the Bible doesn't allow for this, the scriptures are clear in teaching on this, then we have a rock-solid foundation upon which we can respond to these realities. Now, as we're speaking about these things, we also want to realize that as we respond to things like LGBTQ, we must respond with compassion. We must respond to people that are trapped in a system and a lifestyle of sin, just as we would respond to those who are caught in a system and lifestyle of sin that might be um, from, from a witch doctor background or from an alcoholic background, right? This is how we should respond. It's with compassion, but compassion continues to call sin, sin. It continues to call people out of sinful backgrounds and into repentance and faith. So, aberrant theology is abounding around the world. These are some of the realities that our team talked about that is happening here uh, in Africa. The next major group that we're, our next major category of aberrant theology we're seeing in Africa are different cult groups. And I put this uh, slide up and said, all right, can we immediately identify who these groups are? And of course, on the left, you have the Jehovah's Witness and all of, all of their paraphernalia. And then on the right, unmistakably, right, who is this? Right, the Mormons and their, I don't know if there's a place somewhere that just manufactures the white shirts for those guys or what, but they always have the white shirts with the name badge. I make sure I never go outside uh, in a long way wearing a white shirt. And, and, if I, and if I do, I don't want to make sure, I have no name badge or anything. I don't want to be confused with these guys. Um, but they're everywhere, hey? I mean, uh, everywhere we go, we see Jehovah's Witness and Mormons, and of course, now when I was growing up in the U.S., and of course these are uh, American-born uh, uh, her heretical cult groups, when I was growing up in the U.S., the Mormons, their pitch, the way that they sold themselves was we are the true church. The other things are false and we are true. But now the tact that they're taking is we are one choice. We are a denomination. They, they're wanting to say we're just like you. And that's a false teaching. They're not our brothers and sisters in Christ. They are lost people that need to be one to the Lord through repentance and faith. So cult groups are here. They've come in. This is a great example of what Paul prophesied, right? They're, this is a great example of savage wolves coming in from the outside, but even now, we're seeing cult groups growing up from African soil. Groups that have come in, uh, have started to grow up 
from here. So I was t talking with my brothers on my team, and they said, oh, you don't, it's not just the Mormons. It's not just the Jehovah's Witness. And my, my Nigerian brother is able to tell me about groups in Nigeria. My uh, Botswana brother is able to tell me about groups there in Botswana that are, that are native born in these places. And only you in your context will be able to know all of those, but we know that they're there. And we know that oftentimes they're going to take the tact of saying, no, no, we're just like you. We're another form of Christianity when, in fact, they deny key aspects of, uh, of, of sound doctrine like the <coughs> humanity of Christ, like the deity of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity. All of these groups have to be met with sound biblical responses. So uh, all of these issues represent challenges to our faith and continue to be problems throughout the continent, the conclusion of our group is that the most clear and present dangers to the Baptist faith in Africa are two uh, overlapping groups. We, we, we continue to treat them as two groups, but they, they, are, they have a significant amount of overlap, and it's ones that we've already mentioned this week, and that is the prosperity. The first one we'll mention is the prosperity gospel. Now, we know, of course, that this message is no gospel at all. This is, we, we call it the prosperity gospel. We, I don't even like it when I put it up there. I probably should put the gospel in quotation marks or something because they call themselves the gospel. This is not the gospel. This is not the message of the life, death, burial, resurrection of Christ. This is a false teaching that, as Dr. Mburu expressed yesterday, leads to feed, or exists to feed the false teachers at the expense of the poor and needy. As Ke Kevin mentioned yesterday, the prosperity gospel may have had its origins in the United States, but we're no longer in need of relying upon false teachers from America because false teachers have grown up from within Africa. It's being promoted by so-called pastors who are not pastors, who are not shepherds. These are wolves that have come in to devour the flock. And they're seeking to do nothing other than feed their own bank accounts and feed their own egos. We have to start calling these things what they are. Our group has seen that this is a clear and present danger to the Baptist church in Africa. The second group, overlapping group, uh, again was mentioned yesterday. Neo-Pentecostalism, we'll, we'll come back to this later. But for now, I'll mention that this movement, as demonstrated by Randy Arnett's work, has infected even our Baptist churches. An inordinate emphasis on religious experience over the authority of the Bible is leading to so-called pastors who abuse people who remain, again, sheep without a true shepherd. So that's the reality. False teaching abounds both in our communities and even in our churches and Ab 316 is Ab 10's response to this reality. And so our role is summed up in our mission statement. Now I'm going to do something I normally don't like to do, which is to read to you a slide, but we felt like it would be good just to get this mission statement in front of you. Um, it's, it's more, I think this is the one that's in the program there. Uh, but we, we've, we've tweaked it just a bit. One of the concerns that we we had was to make sure that we see that AB 316 is a intimate or a integral part of AB 10. It's not a separate group, so we've changed some of the wording there just, just slightly. But let me read it to you. We are a task force of AB 10 concerned with protecting the integrity of the gospel. We research and address aberrant doctrines. The main two and overlapping groups which we are currently researching and addressing are Neo-Pentecostalism and the prosperity gospel. We also seek to how we, seek, we also study how these false doctrines impact the evangelical faith and seek a response to these new emphases. We will undertake publications and multimedia materials to equip Christians with biblical truth and to promote the evangelical faith. So that is who we are, why we exist, what we are doing. And again, we're doing this uh, under the umbrella of the Africa Baptist Theological Education Network. Um, so finally, we get to... Uh, our name, AB 316, tagline, preserving the gospel, safeguarding the scriptures, 
and you see these three uh, scripture passages that we derive our name from, 2 Timothy 3.16, John 3.16, 1 John 3.16, and these are verses that you all know well. So let me introduce you, finally, let me introduce you to our team. I, I, I am just one of the members of this team, so let me introduce you to our team. Uh, if you gentlemen will uh, make yourselves known as I do it. Phil Barnes, that's be, me. Baz Basera there uh, from Zimbabwe. Uh, Drs. Math Matthews Ojo there from Nigeria. Uh, Jack Ronto here from Botswana. Trevor Yoakum in Abstentia. Trevor's still in the States, should be back on the continent next month. Uh, serves in Togo. And uh, last but not, certainly not least, uh, Brother Meshach Zulu from Zambia. So each one of these men has contributed greatly to AB 316, and I personally am thankful for their uh, fellowship and encouragement uh, over the last few months as we've been working together. So uh, just a bit more of a history of, of our team. The team was assembled, as I think Kevin mentioned this the other day, the team was mentioned or was uh, assembled by nominations given by this group. A after we left, uh, we ran out of time to kind of form a team before, before we left last year. But after we left, an email was sent out saying, okay, this is what we're wanting to do. We're wanting to form this, this group and please send me your nominations. And uh, we, uh, Kevin collected those nominations and that's, that's who is, is here, is, is your institutions and you as individuals nominated uh, these various individuals. And so once the team was formed, we called a meeting uh, to figure out what our next steps were. Uh, so the first uh, meeting was in December uh, 2018, and then we met just uh, two days before the, uh, this meeting. So that, that's kind of a bit of our history. The first uh, meeting took place in Johannesburg. Uh, and at this meeting, we kind of got together saying, what are we doing? What, what, what exactly? We knew the general outline of why we were uh, a group, but what specifically are we, who, who are we, what are we going to do? Uh, this is where we laid out a vision, came up with a mission statement, came up with a name, and we made concrete step, uh, plans for our first steps. And uh, unfortunately, Baz is not in this picture because he took the picture, but he, well, he was there. Yeah. I got back from that meeting, and my wife was very mad at me because I didn't take any pictures. So uh, anyway, so then I made a, a better effort this time and got a proper uh, picture just out, out in front of the Brackenhurst sign here. And again, we met, uh, I guess that would have been Monday and Tuesday before, before this meeting began. We discussed the uh, progress so far and dreamed about plans for the future. And so that's where I want to move to now is to start talking to you about where we have been and where we, under the Lord's grace, we will go. Uh, yeah, so first steps, uh, we came up with the idea that the first steps we wanted to do uh, were to establish a online presence. Uh, and we said we need to be on social media, we need a website, and then the kind of step 1A was we felt like we needed to write a book. And again, if you've heard from us, uh, you, it's probably because you've been asked to contribute to the book, and I'm going to come to that in a few minutes. Um, but this, the, we, when we said, yeah, we need to do a book, but we said, hey, it's 20, it was 2018 at the time, 2019 now, the reality is that we can get online and we can start disseminating information uh, that way a lot faster than we can pop, 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 uh, possibly publish a book. So uh, we immediately, or actually just within a few uh, weeks after our meeting there in Johannesburg, we started a Twitter account, Facebook account, and a website. And when I say we, I mean other people, because I didn't do much of anything. Uh, Baz uh, started our Twitter account and our Facebook page, and uh, William Hahn there in the back uh, uh, set up our website, which is now live, and if you go to it, you'll probably crash the internet in this room, so don't do that just yet, but maybe afterwards. Uh, and if again, maybe you've seen some of that. We're starting to pick up some followers. Uh, the latest thing that we have is, in, in this regard is a WhatsApp group, 
And as you go to tea on the table that's outside the doors here on my left, there's some tables there, there's a sign-up sheet. If you're interested in being a part of that WhatsApp group, just, just put your name and your phone number, including your country code there. Baz will add you to that WhatsApp group. It's going to be uh, a one-way street on that, okay? It's going to be a news disseminating kind of thing, kind of a broadcast group so that when we have information we want to get out to you, it'll be go going that way. And again, when I say we, I mean Bass, because he's the one that does all the work. I just stand up here. Well, one of the reasons that we thought about uh, multimedia presence was this reality. I found this slide quite fascinating. Share of population in sub-Saharan Africa with access to the following things. 39% of sub-Saharan Africa has access to mobile phone, which is more than access to electricity, sanitation, financial services, or paved roads. If we want to communicate in Africa, the way to communicate, apparently, is uh, mobile phone access. The uh, articles that I've read about this say that Africans are jumping over laptops and going straight to everything's on smartphone. Uh, there's, there's no uh, programs and things to, to send to the laptop, but instead, how can I access on, uh, something in, in the palm of my hand? And this is going to impact everything from news dissemination to e-learning and everything else. So uh, Africa is online. Uh, another uh, image uh, uh, just showing uh, Africa, the digital frontier, the mobile market increased fourfold in about five years in Africa, so AB316 must have an online presence. Uh, and again, uh, we would be very interested in you following us on Twitter, joining our Facebook uh, group there, and, and signing, or signing up for the WhatsApp group in the back. Uh, the big idea is that Africa is increasingly connected to the rest of the world. And again, Africa will both receive information and be giving information to the rest of the world so having an online presence is going to be absolutely essential. So that was kind of step one, a step that we were able to do, again, almost immediately. Uh, I think by January, the Twitter and Facebook page were up, and uh, just in the last few weeks, the website has finally gone, gone live. It's, uh, William's been working on it for several months, but now it's finally live, and you'll find a link there back and forth from AB10's website to AB316 and back. But the next step was uh, the multi-authored book project. So if you've heard of AB316, it's probably because you are one of the authors has, who has been recruited by me or one of my teammates to uh, be a contributing author to this book called The Abandoned Gospel. And if, I'm, uh, if, if I remember correctly, I think it might have been Brother Jack that came up with the title, which I really love, The Abandoned Gospel, because we see that the gospel, the message, we won't call it the gospel, the message that is being preached by these groups is in fact not the gospel, but the gospel has been abandoned in favor of a different message. So we have 24 different authors that are collaborating to write a book, and most of them are in this room. Represent a cross-section of Africa as best as we could, again, uh, uh, trying to uh, to think about who, who is uh, going to be able to speak into those different contexts. So we have West Africa, East Africa, Central Africa, Southern Africa, all represented. Uh, our jumping off point, if you will, is this, this book that most of you, I'm sure, have, or have read or at least familiar with, The Pentecostalization, the Evolution of Baptist in Africa. And in the fifth chapter of this book, Randy lists key characteristics of neo-Pentecostalism. In the twelfth chapter of this book, Randy lists uh, foundations for church planning and foundations for church development. These lists became the outline for our book. So we, we, we said, yeah, these are jumping off points. These are where we need to go. That, that we're, we're going to say, okay, how has this happened? How has Pentecostalization happened in our churches? And what can be our response? And so uh, we are writing this book because we believe that these two uh, groups represent departures from the faith delivered once, and all, once for all time to the saints. And so in addition to being the first phase of our work, we are planning some more phases, uh, which I'll talk about later. Uh, but this is, the, again, the first phase of our, of our work. We're prayerful that this book will become a catalyst 
for other groups to begin producing their own material for use in their own languages, own context, etc. So, but to the book it, uh, itself, um, we are uh, working with the IMB, uh, who has agreed to copy, edit, format, and publish uh, the book. Uh, so, and then working with Brother Ken Mbugwa from Ecclesia Africa to work on distribution here in Africa, uh, and as well as some follow-up material as well. So we are uh, very thankful for those partners. Plans for the future. We are dreaming big dreams. We see two major phases to come. The next two phases would be uh, rolling out the book. We would love to have uh, accompanying AB 316 conferences in your various contexts. Um, these could be regional, and so we are looking for conventions, unions, fellowships, et cetera, all around Africa that would be willing to uh, host AB 316 events in which we can raise awareness uh, uh, of this issue and seek to equip people with a response to prosperity gospel, neo-Pentecostalism. And then the second phase is to develop AB uh, 316 discipleship materials. And we are very aware of the need for both literate and oral resources uh, across the continent. And we are, uh, again, in the planning phases of thinking of how can we develop taking this book, which in the end is probably going to be about a 300-page book, and condensing it into bite-sized uh, uh, pamphlets and things like that that can be distributed that would also be developed from your context uh, and for your purposes. So um, what we need from you, we need your help. First things that you can do is to just to continue to pray that the, that the gospel would not be abandoned, but in fact that AB 316 would be a useful tool in the Lord's hands and that he would use it to confront false theologies and false teachings that are happening. You can join our Facebook, uh, follow us on Twitter, join the WhatsApp group to keep up with the latest things happening uh, and, and to get prayer requests. You can submit articles for our website. And I'm going to give you a... a email address in a few minutes, but you can submit uh, articles for our website. You can volunteer to host these AB 316 events. And we were talking yesterday, one of the things that we would like to do even next year in 2020 would uh, be able to get a 10 or 15 minute slot at your annual meetings. At the, uh, there's convention leaders represented here. And if there's a possibility to get one of our team to come and to, and to talk about AB 316, at whatever you call your uh, convention or fellowship or union or whatever meetings that you have each year, we would love to be able to be there. And again, help us to develop future materials, and we are very, very open to your ideas. So let me uh, go to this one first. That is our email address, ab316info at gmail.com. It should the M fell off the end of the screen there. Uh, but it should be ab316info at gmail.com. And then if you follow us on Twitter or Facebook, uh, you can also uh, get us there by direct message and, and whatnot. So then back to this one. Kevin, I don't know we have five minutes. So five minutes if there's any questions about who we are, what we seek to be doing. Yeah, we, you know, because we're just in the early stages of talking with publishers about that, you know, we would like to have the book assembled by the end of the year and therefore would like the book to be uh, published, printed by next year's general meetings. That's, that's why we kind of targeted that date as saying, uh, yeah, yeah, so we're, and that I think for most places that I'm aware of, that's usually uh, Northern Hemisphere summer, so we're, we're hoping that we have books by then, yeah. 